Throughout the history of the NCAA Basketball Championship, there have been those games that have stood out among all the rest. The lead changes hands in a great college championship game. Forgets the deadline. He's down to seven seconds. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of luck. watched great athletes perform at the highest level and it was fun to watch, fun to watch today on film. Weber front door, Carolina with foul. He takes the timeout, they're out of timeout. Technical foul, technical foul on Michigan. They're out of timeout. It's always there, it'll never go away. And so you can always, when you need it, watch it and talk about it and inspire yourself. March Madness, the greatest games of the NCAA Basketball Championship. The 1993 NCAA Championship Final, Michigan against North Carolina. When Michigan's Fab Five stepped onto the floor to face Dean Smith's North Carolina Tar Heels for the 1993 National Championship, the action was both fast-paced and fascinating. There probably can't be a bigger contrast in college basketball than the one between Michigan and North Carolina. North Carolina is patterned, system, everything planned well in advance. Michigan was improvisation, just see where your talent takes you. Both ways can be successful in college basketball, and that's what we, that's what we found out by the fact that both teams reached the championship game. For people who like to see differing styles of play, this was, this was your ultimate game. You know, people always want to have a good guy, bad guy in a championship, and I think they were the good guys who were the bad guys. Thanks to the aggressive inside play of George Lynch and the incredible hot shooting of the tournament's most outstanding player, Donald Williams, North Carolina took a slim first half lead. A great leader by Williams. He was in the groove and we were able to get him open. He was able to come down and drain one shot I thought was about from half court and it went in. And, uh, Coach Smith kind of gave it a, like <laughs> that kind of look, and, but he's just did a great job. Trailing by six at the half, Michigan began the game's final 20 minutes with a vintage run. Jimmy King, there'll be no stopping him. The game is tied. Alley up to Weber for the dunk. Weber with 21, Michigan leads 60 58. Away, gets it. Midway through the second half, the Wolverines took the lead and then held on as the game entered the final five minutes. But North Carolina refused to be intimidated by Michigan's quickness and muscle and went on a 9 0 run of its own. Carolina retakes the lead at 68 to 67. Turn toward the left sideline. Drops it off to Montross. Up by five, five with just power. over three minutes to play. Carolina frantically tried to keep Michigan at bay. Jackson just inside the three-point arc, and he hits it. Ray Jackson has six, and Michigan will use their final timeout. Michigan forces the turnover. But the Wolverines refuse to quit, setting the stage for an unusual ending to a classic Sullivan game. Sullivan will go to the line with 20 seconds remaining. He's a 79% free throw shooter. Let's see what Sullivan can do here. Sullivan's flip, got it. 73 71 Carolina, 20 seconds left. Sullivan shooting to give Carolina a three point lead. Sullivan's free throw is no good. Rebounded by Weber. Michigan out of timeout. And Weber, front court, Carolina thought he'd travel with it. I dribbled down the court looking for someone, you know, just looking to see if, you know, what's going on. And then my automatic reaction is to call a timeout and set something up. So I did that, and obviously we didn't have any time I was left. I didn't know what was going on. I knew there was a lot of mayhem out there, but then I looked over to our bench to see what coaches were doing, and Coach Guthridge, who's, who's the real statistician for us, uh, he got this grin on his face, and I don't think I'll ever forget it. it. It just told me that they really didn't have a timeout, and I just kind of giggled to myself and uh, stomped my feet. <laughs> that was probably the lowest point of my life right there. Nothing you could have said could have affected me. At that time, all I was thinking was, you know, God, why would you let this happen to me? You know, I was the only one in the gym at that time. That lapse in judgment resulted in a two-shot technical foul, plus possession of the ball for Carolina, ending Michigan's championship dreams. 
However, a closer look from another angle shows that Weber might not have been the only Wolverine who was unaware that Michigan was out of timeouts. When I heard voices or not, that doesn't matter. I called a timeout when we didn't have one. And it probably cost our team the game. To me, that has no bearing on the game because we had three fouls to give. And let's say we might have stolen the ball and we were up. So I, I just don't think that has a lot to do and, uh, with it. And yet, we're certainly glad it happened because it ensured the win versus we probably won the other way. Well, Dean Smith is supposed to say we still would have won. But yeah, it did. Because we, if I would have known we didn't have a timeout, I would have sure enough tried to score and uh, never count us out. So even if it would have came down to a last second behind the head, blindfold shot, you never know. We all make mistakes. I just made mine in front of, you know, 20 million people. The 1966 NCAA Championship Final, Kentucky against Texas Western. Just one day before the 1966 NCAA Championship Final, number one ranked Kentucky outlasted number two Duke 83-79 in what had been a much anticipated national semifinal. Everybody pretty much said that the winner of the Duke Kentucky semifinal game would probably eventually win uh, the NCAA championship. That's very demeaning to us. And we said to ourselves, the game is won on the court, not in the paper. And they got to come and get it if they want it. So in the final, it was eight off Rupp's tradition soaked Wildcats against Don Haskins upstarts from Texas Western. They were playing for something a, a lot more than I think people realize at that time. I mean, uh, it wasn't written about very much back then, but it was basically five black players, or, or the perception was against five southern white guys. You know, I'm from New York, so I sort of presented that. And, and there was a feeling on the court uh, that uh, I think coming from them that, that this was more to them than just the basketball game because they had something to prove, and, and they did. With no starter taller than six foot five, Kentucky found out right away against Texas Western that the Miners meant business. The moon first played a game. I had the ball on the right-hand side of the court. I threw a lob pass to David Ladin, and he dunked the ball. And that put a little fear in your hand. So it was about six foot seven, two forty-five, coming down dunking on you. So it made me a little nervous too, I think. We went into the game confident, but that could shake your confidence just a little bit when you see a guy go up above the rim like that. Texas Western's inside attack was the perfect antidote to Kentucky's outside game. While the Miners' aggressive, intimidating defense gave the Wildcats fits all night long. We were not paying attention. We were not uh, alert enough. It was a switching situation, and I didn't even see him. I mean, all of a sudden, I was pushing air instead of the ball. He took it, took it and, and went down the floor. He just put it out there and just made one move and then was wide open and then oh, turned him the next time. and. And it was wide open for me again, so two in a row in a couple of seconds. They do the same thing to last year, and here's Hill with another gimme. Hey now, this looks pretty bad. Kentucky has just gone flat-footed. Kentucky's lost that bounce and zip. We were a small team, and we beat everybody with quickness. We tended to be quicker than almost every team we played. And then for once, we clearly weren't quicker than this team. It was a great game because it pitted uh, defense against offense and uh, they were a team averaging 97 points a game and uh, we held them to 65 and if we'd played them the next night I think we could have held them to 65. The night Texas Western beat Kentucky was not only one of the NCAA tournament's most exciting games but it was also one of the most important. I think it opened a whole lot of doors down south because everybody thought five blacks couldn't play together and they had no discipline. They would just go out there, just throw them out there and let them go wild and crazy. And that's the championship. That's the top of the college. You can't go any higher. The 1983 NCAA Championship Final. Houston against North Carolina State. Perhaps no team in NCAA tournament history had as memorable a championship run as North Carolina State in 1983. Remember how North Carolina State got to the finals? It was a miracle after a miracle. They called them the Cinderella team. Oh, yeah. There were times they were down and out for the count. There was no way that Valvano's team was going to get to Albuquerque in the pit. And yet they continued to do it. 
If there was a team of destiny, North Carolina State was that team of destiny. But if ever there were a prohibitive favorite, it was the University of Houston, which crushed Louisville in a dunk-filled national semifinal. And I watch Houston and Louisville, and I've never seen a more athletic, a more awesome display of basketball power in my life than by the Faisland of Gemma. And that's when I started to have doubts about national championship. I said to myself, how in the world do you match up? How in the world do you play anybody with talent like this? One way was for the Wolfpack to get an inspired speech from their coach, Jim Valvano. It was one of the best Newt Rockney locker room talks I've ever given in my life. Um, the kids, every once in a while, they were getting ready to go. They thought I was finished. I'd say, I'm not done yet. Sit down. They'd go, I'm not done. Sit down. You know, I, got, I talked to each, every one of them in their face personally. Basically, the theme was, you have to play a perfect game. And then after each guy, I'd say, and we're going to win the national championship. Outside is low, In the game's first 20 minutes, North Carolina State almost did play the perfect half, slowing the pace down while making the most of its offensive opportunities. the long range bomber. And so the surprising North Carolina State team leads the number one ranked team in the country. 33 to 25. And now we talked at halftime about how we had 20 minutes to do something that no one ever thought we could do, that only we thought we could get done. But I think what happened, we were not a team used to padding the lead, holding the lead, and we went out in the second half and, and really got conservative, I think. We, we really didn't want to, didn't talk about doing that, but when you're up and you've got 20 minutes to win a national championship and no one thought you'd be there, uh, the pressure starts to get to you a little bit. In the second half, Houston turned the game around, scoring 17 of the first 19 points to take a seven-point lead. But the Cougars couldn't keep the pressure on. We ran out of gas. I came, certainly ran out of gas. We had to take him out of the game and give him uh, oxygen. Everybody thought we were in a, a real delay game, and all I was trying to do is rest my players, because you can't rest when you're on defense. You've got to rest a little bit on offense. Coupled with the pressure that that puts on a team to hold the ball, and they weren't that type of team, and with the fact that we fouled them every time down, and that was Coach V's philosophy. We made them go to the free throw line, and they kept missing. And uh, that's how we made the comeback. We put the pressure on them, and we wanted the ball in our hands to win the game. We come down now, as you see, to 48 seconds. 52 all. This is for the national championship. Time out. North Carolina State has one remaining. That's when you have time to think about it, when you have a timeout. Not when you're playing, but here it is. This is what you've worked for all your life. You're in the timeout. You've got the ball the last possession to win it. But Coach V diagrammed a play uh, that was supposed to get one of the uh, perimeter players a layup going to the basket or a dump off to uh, either Thurl himself on the inside. It's a well laid plan, but it didn't work. It didn't come out that way because Houston came out in a trap, which kind of surprised us. We were able to hold the ball. They almost stole it a couple times. And in fact, Drexler almost stole it one down for a dunk. Uh, we get it into the corner, Thrill Bailey has it in the corner. Everything's messed up at this point. The clock's running out. We got no idea how we're gonna score. It's down to seven seconds. You can see the time. Well, what went through my mind was I thought that we were gonna steal the ball from that guard out there and take it down and dunk it on the other end. I really thought that was gonna happen. And I know that's what Akeem thought. So I thought he had it still. So I was getting ready to fill the lane, you know, then the, uh, the guy recovered the ball. Shoot it up in the air. I was standing under the basket at the time just trying to get position for an offensive rebound so I could see that the ball was going to fall short so I just more or less I just reacted and put the ball in the basket. Wittenberg, oh that's a long ways! Oh! Witt just took it and, and heaved it and he tells you it's a pass but well who am I to say it wasn't a pass it was a great pass to Lorenzo Charles to win a national championship. I could hear the announcers say NC State National Champions 1983 and I realized I had done it it was over and uh, everybody was out on the court hugging and everything. It was just a good feeling. The 
Washington Post wrote that uh, uh, trees would tap dance, elephants would drive the Indianapolis 500, and Orson Welles would skip breakfast, lunch, and dinner before NC State figured out a way to beat Houston. You know, when it was over, you know, I get on the phone and say, hey, order the elephants up, teach them to drive, babe, because they go to Indianapolis. The 1987 NCAA Championship Final, Syracuse against Indiana. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Louisiana Superdome for this evening's national championship game between the Syracuse University Orange Men and the Indiana University Hoosiers. The championship game was a struggle for us. I felt that, that we were a step to a half a step behind throughout the course of the entire game. We got out and it, and it really looked to me like we had absolute control of the game. Thomas, Cycli was there defensively. Coleman is out and now Douglas on the move. Three on two and Trish. We got off to a pretty slow start and the game was going somewhat back and forth and Steve having a good start kept us in the ball game. Alford's alone and Alford makes him pay with the three. Alford's three. That being the first year that they put the three-point line in, it was a big concern of mine because I knew I'd have a lot of fun. Now my jump shots were worth one more point. He'd like to see Alfred put something up. There you go. The three from him is good. The three-point line really was a layup to him. I mean, he could shoot the ball with the best of anyone. And Indiana can come down and tie it or go ahead if Alfred can hit a three. Thanks to Steve Alford's four first-half three-pointers, Indiana did more than just stay in the game. They don't do it. The three. And Indiana takes the halftime lead as a result. I knew that I had played a bad uh, first half, and I wanted to concentrate and be able to stay on the floor for the second half and try and get out of this thing that I was in. Here's Smart. But for Keith Smart, the second half began like the first end. Six. That made night hot. He's going to take Smart out of the ball game. Now, Bobby getting a little impatient there with Keith Smart. Coach Knight took me out of the ball game, and I went to the bench. And I remember Joby Wright coming over to me saying, uh, just keep your head in. I remember that, keep your head in, you're going to go back in. But of course, sometimes in a game, no matter what the situation is, uh, you will sometimes come out of a ball game and not go back in. And I thought, that's what I thought. So I went there to the bench thinking that my night was over and I was finished. There's the three. Right after Smart left the lineup, Indiana might have thought its night was over when Syracuse took a 10-point lead. It's a crisis moment for Knight and the Hoosiers here. At Coach Knight came down to, to me and said, are you ready to play? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm giving you two minutes. And if you haven't done anything in two minutes, I'm taking you out and you're finished for the night. Monroe's back, smart, very quick, pulls up. Here's smart again, he's sliding inside, creating a basket. I think there was a stretch there in the final game where he did carry us. It seemed like he got all the rebounds. A strong rebound by Smart. He uh, handled the ball the majority of the time. Now Smart kind of tries a nice pass underneath to Thomas. He shot the majority of the time. Off the cut, it's Smart again. I mean, he really took over the game in the last five minutes. Smart comes back at the other end with a driving layup. He has taken over here in the second half. We had to make several big plays just to stay in the ball game. On his way to scoring 12 of the Hoosiers' last 15 points, Smart eventually brought Indiana to within one. Hits the two, and a quick timeout is called at the 32nd mark. A smart play by Smart. And Indiana very seldom presses, but here they go full court. Smart committed the foul, which only used up one second of time. He's short. There he went. He missed a shot. We get the opportunity to uh, win the game or lose the game. Indiana can win it. Everything is in slow motion. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear all the fans screaming and yelling. But from the time going up to take the shot, everything was complete silent. I don't even remember seeing the floor, the players, or any of that. All I remember was the ball going into the basket and hearing this big explosion of noise. Smart takes the shot, oh! and the Hoosiers with three seconds. That's when I seem to have woken up from this dream or whatever. But here it goes. Indiana wins the championship. Keith Smart is the hero. It is every kid uh, dream uh, to be on a basketball court, the winding moments, to hit a shot to win a national championship. And my dream did come true. 
The 1977 NCAA National Semifinal, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte against Marquette. In his final season of coaching, Marquette's Al McGuire brought his Warriors into the 1977 National Semifinals, where in a low-scoring game they took an early lead against the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. But in the second half, UNCC battled back, and with just under two minutes to go, the unheralded 49ers still had a three-point lead. Then Marquette's All-American guard, Butch Lee, took over. Lee's two jumpers gave Marquette a one-point lead. And when Gary Rosenberger was fouled with 10 seconds to play, the Warriors had a chance to put the game away. But before Rosenberger could go to the line, UNC Charlotte called timeout, during which McGuire kept pounding him on his left arm, as he would say later, to keep him loose. Whatever the reason, Rosenberger made just one of two foul shots to set the stage for a remarkable ending. They were up by two, and we had the ball, I think, with 10 seconds to go. And our coach looked at, looked at our bench and said, all right, who wants to have the last shot? And everybody kind of was like, well, I don't want it. So with that, I think, and I, and I just kind of said, well, you know, I'll take the shot. Then the most unbelievable play, probably uh, one of the most controversial plays of all time, happened. Butch, he he's off and throws a long pass, and I see the ball in the air, and I know I can intercept it. So I jump up to intercept the ball, and the ball hits me in the hand. Jerome Whitehead comes from behind, he kind of bumps me in the back. Me being frail and weak at the time, he, he knocks the ball out, catches it, goes to the basket, so I immediately turn around. He's going to dump the ball, I go up, and I block the shot. The shot hangs on the rim, fills around, and the ball fell in. The horn went. Nobody knew whether the shot was good or not. And immediately, uh, the refs are going to the scorer. And the scorer is getting paid maybe $11. He's probably not getting paid anything. All he wants is to have peace and comfort there. So I jump up, and I know this indecision. You knew you were just like sitting in the electric chair. It's like, did I get the call from the governor? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> so, and everybody was just waiting and they were discussing the time on the clock. I said, now you know it's good. You know it's good, call it. Galvin walked away and did that. And that was probably the, the nicest moment in basketball on the court in my life. The 1982 NCAA Championship Final, Georgetown against North Carolina. In going for his first NCAA Championship, North Carolina's Dean Smith had to overcome Patrick Ewing and Georgetown. And from the beginning of the title game, it was apparent that Ewing intended to intimidate. And that'll be another goaltending. That was their, um, what Coach Thompson wanted to kind of put forth in the beginning was, hey, we're going to dominate the interior. We wanted him to establish a tone in the middle that we were going to try to cut down on penetration. North Carolina, like most smart teams, come to the basket. We were, I think, mature enough to say, hey, fine, we'll throw it up there as much as you want. You can goaltend, you know, all game long. We took it as, as, as two points, you know. He blocked, uh, he goaltended five shots, and I think we had great leadership. James Worthy, Sam Perkins, Jimmy Black. Uh, they've been there before so they knew how to respond. Especially James Worthy. He's the bread and butter man right now. We always felt that James Worthy was the one that broke out back in that game. If it wasn't for him, they wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been a close ball game. But he carried him on his back as a superstar he is, and uh, he, he, he rose to the occasion. Worthy with that beautiful Archie shot as Worthy's 28 points, points led all scorers. But on this night, the amount of talent on the floor was remarkable, with great players continually making great plays. The momentum's changing. Brown mishandled the ball. He lost the handle. Look out. Back door. Played me forward. Worthy, beautiful pass to Worthy. Ewing bobble chips. Ewing again. Ewing again. Ewing again. Jordan is playing superb basketball to Worthy. 
At no time during the game's last 30 minutes did either team lead by more than four points. And as the game entered the final minute, North Carolina clung to a one-point lead. We were in four corners, up one, and uh, Eric Smith was guarding me. I got the ball, and he picked the ball from me, and the uh, ref called a foul. And uh, I got to the foul line, missed the front of the one-on-one -on -one badly. And I'm running back on defense, and I remember tears coming to my eyes saying, I just lost Coach Smith, a national championship. And now Georgetown can take the lead. One sixteen left. And yeah, we moved it around, and I was supposed to get it at the top and just create. I think a sleepy boy is going to go for the jumper. Is he ever? Fake beautifully once, twice, gets a roll, and the players lead by one. Carolina came down the floor trailing by one and uh, took a timeout. In the huddle, it was discussed about whether or not Worthy or Perkins would be open underneath. We did set it up to go, it's a play to go inside, but if they cover that, we throw a cross court against the zone and usually have an easy jump shot. For some odd reason, Coach Smith thought that Michael may be the one, being a freshman, uh, they might want to put the pressure on him a little bit. You know, once he looked at me and said, you may have the shot, if you got the shot, take it. That's all I needed from, you know, from a confidence standpoint that, hey, he believed in me to take the shot. Everyone heard him actually tell me if I got an open shot, take it. So when that opportunity came, you know, I didn't have any second thoughts. We got Michael open and he took a shot that probably dictated the rest of our lives in a sense. The time, 18. Shot, Jordan, Michael Jordan. I watched the film quite a few times. If you look, there was no hesitation. As soon as I got it, I knew I had his consent to take the shot. So I just went right up with, uh, with no thought in mind except for making the shot and made it. Then things got kind of chaotic. And I thought as soon as Jordan made the basket that Georgetown would take a timeout and was shocked when they did not. We felt that if we called timeout at the time that we wouldn't know what defense North Carolina would be in. They could have trapped, they could have gone zone, they could have gone man. So we had decided that we were going to explode out. You know, it was a lot of a lot of nervousness going on out there. Fred Brown, who I think at the time was a sophomore, uh, really, didn't, really didn't have the experience. Fred Brown knew that he was not supposed to have the ball in his hands. Without Coach Smith's permission, I was gambling on defense. And uh, Fred Brown kind of pump faked the ball toward Ed, and I thought maybe he may let it go. And so I just jumped out of the passing lane. I guess I was so far out a uh, position that he thought I may have been one of his teammates. He threw me the ball. Oh, he threw it to the wrong man! He threw it to Worthy! It's over! It's over! This talented group of Tar Heels had finally given Dean Smith his championship with a dream ending. I was thinking about it on the way over on the bus. I was sleeping a little bit, which, you know, sometimes I do, especially when I'm nervous. Uh, it kind of relaxes me. But at that particular time, I was thinking about just being put in a situation where you have to make the game winning shot. You know, before I could really see the outcome, we were there at the Superdome. So, ironically enough, the game ends with myself making you know, a winning shot. And I just dreamed it on my way over, over to the you know, Superdome. The 1974 NCAA National Semifinal, UCLA against North Carolina State. When North Carolina State came on the court to play UCLA, in what would eventually become one of the NCAA tournament's greatest games. They were respectful of the beating the Bruins had given them during the regular season. Maybe the tradition, the mystique, the aura that goes with just winning and winning and winning, maybe that's more than anybody can overcome. To get beat by about 18 is just, it was devastating. But the team's reaction to it, it was, it was something else. You hate to lose to the same team twice, and they had beat us pr pretty pretty well. Actually, it kind of humiliated us the first game, and we wanted to, to get them back. But David Thompson almost didn't get a chance to face UCLA when NC State's star took a serious fall against Pitt in the East Regional Final. Just a week before the Final Four, there was considerable concern that the number one ranked Wolfpack would be without their best player. We didn't know whether Dave was going to be able to play or not in the next game. Tuesday we came out to have practice and as we were leaving the floor, typical of him, he's at midcourt, dribbling the ball, just flipped one up at the basket 
it didn't hit anything but the bottom of the net. 8,000 people went berserk. So that was kind of our send-off to go over and, and play in the, in the Final Four. By 1974, UCLA had won seven straight national titles, and there was little reason to believe it wouldn't make it eight. Except that NC State was virtually playing at home in Greensboro, and the Wolfpack had David Thompson. Well, I had a great defensive player on him, and he didn't stop him, and that was Wilkes. Wilkes uh, was a fine defensive player, but Thompson did have an outstanding night against us, but he usually had outstanding nights against anybody. Thompson's 28 points led the Wolf Pack, but that was topped by Bill Walton's 29, which helped UCLA run out to an 11-point lead midway through the second half. I've often felt that they relaxed to a certain degree during the course of that game. Plus, I think we've turned it up a notch. At that point, when, you get, when you've been beaten so badly in December and then you get down by 11, there almost becomes a, uh, something in your mind that says, well, let's save face. We lost our composure, we lost our concentration, we lost our attacking style. We should have got the job done, we should have finished them off. We were a team in disarray. They were also a team that couldn't shoot straight. During one four minute stretch, the Bruins failed to score a single point, and eventually NC State rallied to tie the game. At the end, the Wolfpack had the best chance to win, but Tim Stoddard missed a jumper, sending the game into overtime. The first extra session resolved nothing. Almost incredibly, each team could only manage a single basket. Sort of like two fighters who punch themselves out. Now they're taking a five minute breather. Bradison underneath. Here's Bradison. He's putting it up and he missed it. And two seconds left. One second but while the first overtime was tentative and sloppy, the second would be one for the ages. Early on, it became evident that UCLA wouldn't easily give up its crown. Led by Walton and Keith Wilkes, the Bruins scored the first seven points of the second overtime. Coach Sloan called a timeout at that point when we were seven down and say, hey, look, you know, one of those brilliant things that coaches say, somebody make something happen. I was saying we need to do this, we need to do that, and Morse's, and somebody had better make it happen quickly because he said, I'm dead tired, you know. But I think that was a tribute to the kind of players that we had. They they were very upbeat and very positive and had a strong belief in the fact that somebody was going to rise to the occasion and we were going to win the basketball game. That somebody was David Thompson. With no shot clock, everybody just knew we were dead again. But uh, we had some great plays, defensive plays by Monty Tile, Mo Rivers, and we were able to fight back and uh, get to the point where I, uh, we're only down by one. Dribbling out behind the key, starts to move down the left side. He shoots over Wilson, hits, Wolf back lead, 76-75. You know, people say, how come you? Seven point lead, how'd you blow it? And I say, oh no, we were doing the same thing that's been working for us for a long, long time, but this time it didn't work. And it was uh, the most dramatic game I've ever been in to win in a game as big as that to beat the seven-time national champs it was like uh, a dream come true. Really. The 1992 East Regional Final Kentucky against Duke. Most likely the best tournament game ever. Oh, it was one of the best games I've ever seen. Uh, I think uh, great players made big plays. Every single play it seemed like they would rise to the occasion to make it greater than the play before. Especially Duke's Christian Leitner. Leitner. From the field or the foul line, Leitner didn't miss a shot all night as Duke, the defending national champions and number one ranked team, looked to have the game in hand midway through the second half. And we have our first double digit lead of the ball game. It's up to 12. Coach said, look, you're going to get down sometimes, you, you know, but keep pressing. We'll have our run and we'll be back in the game. And when it comes down to the last five minutes, we're going to win. Led by a tenacious defense and the incredible shooting of Jamal Mashburn, Kentucky did come back. We, we've always been the underdog, you know ever since I've been at Kentucky. And we like that, we thrived off that. Mashburn, the double team, he beats it. 
Then from then on, it was going back and forth. Back and forth. Another one. Both teams were like, man, you know, we make a big shot thinking that we were going to rattle them. Nice backdoor cut. And they come back and hit a big shot, and they think that we're, they were going to rattle us. Hurley with the fish, basket, yes, and the foul. You're battling for your life. Just when you think that they're going to give up, they come back at you. you know, you're just trying to, to, to get an edge. Woods. In each minute of the game that went by, the play got better and better and better. The execution got better on both ends. Thomas Hill. Beautiful. We, we just watched great athletes perform at the highest level. Down the stretch, both Kentucky and Duke kept the pressure on. Hill. With hearts racing, the two teams traded baskets and dreams down a dramatic stretch run. And when Bobby Hurley missed what could have been the winning jumper, the game went into overtime. The overtime, without a doubt, best overtime game. There were so many shots. Belfry. Grant Hill, Hurley again. We're tied. I'll always marvel at how many great plays so many kids made from both teams. Belfry. Base Hill in, gets another one. Grant Hill inbounds, Leitner. Oh, my goodness. Five lead changes in the last 30 seconds. Mashburn. Fouled. He'll shoot one. You don't see those kind of things happen very often, especially in a game of that stature. Leitner. And he is fouled by Mashburn. Five fouls on Jamal Mashburn. Duke by one. Timeout, Kentucky. Coach told us, look, you know, this is right where we want to be. We're right there in the game. It's ours. It's ours to win. He doesn't designate one player shooting the basketball. That way, Coach felt that there was no pressure on it. You know, nobody didn't have to leave the huddle saying, oh, God, i got to take this shot. 7.8 seconds remaining. Woods. Yes! Sean took the most difficult path. He tried to shoot it over someone's outstretched arm. Made an unbelievable shot. He'll say that he meant to make it, but I'll say that it was a little bit lucky. It went in. Uh, first thing I think that we're going to the Final Four, you know, but unfortunately we left a little time left on the clock. 2.1 seconds left. To be honest, I wasn't too sure, you know, if we were going to win the game, if we were going to be able to pull it out. The first thing I think you have to tell them is we're going to win. Whether you completely believe that or not, you have to get that in their minds and on to the next play. I was supposed to stand in the corner and then flash to the foul line. And Grant was supposed to throw me the ball at the foul line. And that's exactly what happened. There's the pass to Leitner. Puts it up. Yes! There hasn't been a day that I haven't thought about that moment. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to last. Kentucky played a great game, and uh, I was just happy that I had the big guy on my side. It was like slow motion. As soon as he caught the ball, I knew it was going in because he had such a perfect day. He's 10 for 10, and couldn't ask him to do much more. I mean, he didn't miss a shot all day. I can't even expect from a person like that. And I've been coaching 21 years. It was the greatest NCAA game I've ever, I've ever watched. And you realize once again in basketball, it's never over until the final buzz of sounds.